Good evening. So tonight, we're going to look at priorities. What are our priorities as believers in Jesus? How is our freedom affecting others? The Apostle Paul looks at this very con concretely. He explains to the Corinthians as well as to those of us in Los Angeles or anywhere else, that we may be free, but that does not mean that our freedom is to destroy others. I'm Pastor John from Living Stones and Sunland Thonga, Seventh-day Adventist churches, and it is time for the call to prayer. Good evening, my friends. So as you noticed, we are moving forward. We were in the middle of chapter seven, which is a complicated chapter, as you notice, if you've read through it. And I'm not going to get into all of that, but Paul talks even about marriage and how one maybe shouldn't be married in a time that he thought we were in. Actually, he thought it was the last days. He thought Jesus was going to be back maybe 10 years from then, maybe even earlier. And um, But also there was persecution. So if there's persecution, is that a good time to get married? You know, uh, to to have yourself die for Jesus while you just got married and maybe have small children. It's 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 really you're getting into a lot of things that are the realities of the early Christian church, and today we have to think about that as well. I mean, um, as we come to darker times. Sometimes we make decisions ourselves to maybe put Jesus as our only relationship. But truly, in the larger scheme of things, I believe that God made men and women to find their soulmate. Now, not everybody has perhaps their soulmate. There may not be someone for you but there may be a perfect one for you. We need to give it to God. I know with me, I thought that I would not get married. I, I knew that. When I was called to Bangkok, after having graduated from, from theology at Southwestern, I thought I would be a pastor without any wife, and, and it was too late for me. I, there was no way. And I went to Bangkok, Thailand, and I started saying, maybe I'll be like a, uh, a Seventh-day Adventist monk. I'll shave my head, wear red robes, and just kind of do the Buddhist thing, except for Jesus, right? <laughs> and just kind of live the life of someone who teaches others about Jesus and just not have relationship as a part of that, as in, as in uh, some kind of a marriage sexual relationship. And uh, I was full willing to do that. And then God sent Anna to me. It was when I wasn't looking that God brought her to me and I to her. It's, it's, um, so, you know, don't judge things from the beginning. Paul is giving us his opinion. And um, it doesn't mean you have to follow all the things, but the principles we follow. This is why Paul says in the book of, in this part of Corinthians, he says, this is I and not the Lord. And then sometimes he'll say, this is the Lord, but not I. You know, and, and so he'll say, you know, take, if it's God's opinion, you go with that. If it's my opinion, we could have, a, you know, a conversation about it. And we're into that very personal part. And, and in Los Angeles, we are in that today. So uh, we're talking about uh, um, uh, sex outside of marriage that should not be happening. Uh, it does not, it hurts us. It does not help us. A marriage relationship is the best, as Jesus pointed out when he said, one man, one woman, and, and then the two shall become one flesh. And But life happens, you know, there are divorces and remarriages that occur. So you have to, it, it makes it harder in a way to uh, kind of, um, to kind of have that disconnection from one and to another. But, but then again, you know, through this difficult world, we can find a way. We need to make sure that God's a part of these decisions. Just have to make sure God is a part of these decisions, right? So then we get to another part here, which is number eight, which is a very, very controversial part of First Corinthians chapter eight. Now about food sacrificed to idols. We know that we all possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up. And 
uh, love builds up. So what he's getting at is, is sometimes knowledge, we think we're all smart. And so we, um, in our smartness, we can do anything we want. That puffs up. It's like, uh, like, like uh, yeast in our lives. It kind of puffs up. But knowledge builds up. Real love builds up. Real love builds up. So sometimes we know something, in other words, and we think we're awesome, but we don't help anybody else. It just puffs us up, makes us think we're awesome, but it doesn't help God's case. So food sacrifice to idols. In the Roman world, the animals you bought at the temple and you did buy them near the temple because when you bought the animals and their meat, that meat had been sacrificed. It had been killed, just like the meat markets today. Even if it's clean meat, all of them had been sacrificed to an idol. And when you pay for that meat, a portion of that money goes toward that temple. That's just how it was. The temple was in the meat business. Some vegetables as well, by the way. And some fruit, but mostly meat. And so we sometimes don't understand that because we think about going to Albertsons and buying something. But back then you went near the temple and you bought your meat there of the cow or the chicken that was sacrificed to Zeus or to Diana. And so you can see how there'd be some kind of a problem here. Somebody that says there, there's only one God, I worship God in heaven, I'm not going to eat that meat because I was sacrificed to idols. Now, maybe if I raise my own, I'm in the country and raise my own, I'm okay. But I'm not going to be eating that meat that's sacrificed to idols. Paul is going to give us wisdom in this. Um, so this is in verse 3. But whoever loves God is known by God. Verse 4. So then, eating food sacrificed to idols... We know that an idol is nothing at all in the world. We know that idols are hollow. It's just that they're just created things. They're not gods in any real way, sense of the word. And that there is no one but one God. All right, verse 5. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, he's talking about different gods and lords known on this earth, but He's talking about eternal things, though. There is no, only one God that exists in the real world. The real world. But in this world, you know, there are many lords and gods and things that people worship. That doesn't make them true. It just makes them existent. There they are, you know, but they're not living. He's trying to make sure you understand, and I understand, um, that those gods don't exist, but some people think they do. See, some people believe in those gods. They believe in Zeus. They believe in Diana. They believe in all these, you know, Baal in the past and all these different gods. They believe in those things. So what do you do when they say, you're buying something, sacrifice to that God, and you're eating it? Those spirits are going to come into you. They believe that. But Paul says, well, he doesn't believe they exist. It's just... It's just an animal and just meat. But you have different types of people, different backgrounds. And this is about priorities. Who is more important? Are we going to just put other people down and say that they're dumb? They don't know what they're talking about? Paul is like, no. No, they have their thoughts and their feelings. You know, maybe we should care about them, even though... They may not be right. Let's care about them too. You, you see what he's getting at here. Let, let's keep reading. Yet there is only one God, one Father, from whom all things came, through whom all things live. There is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came, through whom we live. Verse 7. But not everyone possesses this knowledge. Some people are still accustomed to idols, that they may eat that they eat sacrificial food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to a god. And since their conscience is weak and defiled, see there? 
they think that it was sacrificed to an idol. And because their conscience is weak, they are then defiled because they really believe. They really believe that that, a God blessed that. And so he says, verse 8, but food does not bring us near to God, nor uh, uh, we are no worse if we do not eat and do better if we do. Verse 9, be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. In other words, you can eat these things, these animals, the cow, and he's talking about clean meats, by the way. He's not talking about unclean meats because all animals were sacrificed basically to the gods in cities like Corinth or Rome or any of these places, Philippi, wherever. If you're out in the country, it's a lot easier because you can actually have a field where you have your own animals, and we know they're not sacrificed to gods, uh, the, the pagan gods. But when you're in the city, they sacrificed them, and that's the food, that's the meat that's there. He says, be careful that your freedom, not worrying, because those gods don't exist, but be careful that those who see you don't fall and say, oh my goodness, at church and with all of us, you talk about God, but then you're eating food sacrificed to animal, to, to, to excuse me, animals sacrificed to, to Zeus. Does he believe in Zeus too? We have that today. There are some that are weak in different ways, whether it be with meat or, or whether it be, you know, if someone saw me at a bar where people are drinking and they thought I was drinking, that might hurt them. They might say, you know what? I can do that too because, you know, Pastor John's doing that. You see the stumbling block? It's very difficult. I may be there to meet someone to bring them to Jesus I don't do that generally, <laughs> but I may be there, but yet they see it differently. We have to work to care for others. Our priority is people, the people that Jesus died for. And I, I'm getting close to the end here, so let me read to the end. So be careful, therefore, as you exercise your rights, that it does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone with a weak conscience sees you with all of your knowledge eating, in an idol's temple, won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? In other words, oh, I can, I can worship other gods too. See, that's what he's getting at. Verse 11, so this weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. Verse 12, when you sin against them in this way and wound their conscience that is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause them to fall. You see this? Jesus wants us to care and have prioritize others rather than what we want only. He wants us to prioritize the ones he died for. Are there things in our lives that sometimes we do that might make other people fall? I know we can't control ourselves. We can't control how people think of us. But we, we can do is do our best to make sure that what we say and what we do are the same thing. My friends, Jesus died for even those who don't understand. Don't let your freedom destroy others. Okay, so I'm looking here. It looks like it's time for us to have intercession. I'll see you in a few moments. May God bless you. Remember, smash the like button, subscribe. See you in a second.